Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, it's great to be with you to, um, to really talk in this uh, first lecture um, on the specific matter of turning polynomial functors uh, to the topic of dynamical systems. Uh, and uh, within today's session, um, you know, beyond just providing a perspective on and commentary on uh, the material uh, associated with the uh, Topos course. Um, I, I wanted to step back um, and, and, and highlight a few features that I think um, uh, were certainly writ large into the, um, the Topos material on polynomial functors. Uh, if you, if you look uh, consistently across the different lectures, but may, may have escaped uh, notice for the centrality and prominence um, uh, of their role. Uh, and their importance may, may not have been emphasized so much by the organizers of that class because so much of the audience uh, consisted of those uh, quite familiar with category theory and, um, who didn't need uh, elements of motivation or uh, added uh, added guidance as to certain sort of key elements of understanding. So uh, I'm hoping uh, specifically to go into some of the basics today on using polynomial functors to, to capture, to specify and capture features of, of dynamical systems. Uh, with the attention here being to discrete dynamical systems, discrete in state space, discrete in time as well, uh, but also to, to hit on this, this bigger issue, which is um, which I think cuts to the heart of, of why these methods uh, offered such promise. Um, uh, and, and that has to do with their categorical properties. So uh, with that preface, I'll just, um, Skip over to my slides here. Okay, so here we're dealing with uh, the polynomial functor course lecture three, which uh, focused on applications of dynamic systems, which is, is really our primary quarry. And I asked you to uh, take a look at, uh, excuse me, these uh, sections of the book, which uh, expand on some of the materials there and add some examples. So, the, the highest level point I want to get to here, if you encounter this material for the first time, you could be forgiven for um, finding it um, intellectually curious and, um, and intricate, uh, but be wondering, um, you know, why uh, go through all the, um, the rigmarole uh, associated with uh, this characterization of dynamical systems as polynomials. It has a certain coherent logic to it, a certain um, uh, consistency to be sure, and, um, and uh, a certain mathematical orderliness. But uh, what benefits does it, does it really offer, one could ask, uh, compared to you know, representation in sheer code or or in any number of other diagrammatic or, or symbolic mechanisms. Well, I, I, I wanted to highlight these features, which um, I think really uh, are somewhat implicit within, within the course coverage for reasons of just to which I've just alluded, probably for that audience that didn't need to be brought out. Um, and, um, and because they end up being emphasized bit by bit uh, throughout the broader course. Um, so one element is that they're uh, incredibly modular, and we'll start to see this in a, in a big way today with, with featuring use of uh, co-product and product to combine together um, multiple polynomials involved in multiple dynamical systems into a single dynamical system. So you can, when you go to specify uh, an entire dynamical system, um, we can fruitfully uh, do so using um, 
using pieces that are defined uh, from other dynamical systems and combine them together in a, in a very seamless, transparent way uh, using products, co-products, and as it turns out in the final bits of today, uh, tensor product. Um, so that allows us to kind of use these pieces of dynamical systems as building blocks. Um, but that tendency will start to mature and further ripen in the next lecture of the polynomial functors course, lecture four, as, uh, as we go into issues concerning the relationship between polynomial functors and, uh, and maps between them on the one hand and wiring diagrams on the other. And we'll see that hierarchical nesting, um, which uh, consists of a sort of uh, composition, uh, forms an incredibly natural um, way of combining dynamical systems and wiring diagrams. And uh, it comes out very seamlessly as well, uh, very transparently in the polynomial functors involved. So there's this ability by articulating them in this kind of sort of strange way as polynomial functors to, to mix and match them, to build them up, to plug and play them, uh, to combine them in various ways, to, to express modes of dynamical systems, to express dynamical systems that, that uh, have multiple sub pieces uh, and or that use input from one or from another kind of delegate to sub dynamical systems. And that's very attractive. Um, another feature that we'll start to see next time is the use of wiring diagrams with these. Now, wiring diagrams won't describe all such polynomial functors. In fact, they'll describe a particularly simple subclass of them, these maps between monomials. Um, and uh, we'll see that even so, they, um, they provide a lot of expressiveness, sometimes expressiveness that's missed in some of the typing relationships on the underlying polynomial functors themselves. And wiring diagrams have this amazing uh, relationship with the underlying symbolic notation that allows them to be used as complements of one another, each complementing the limitations of the other. Um, they're also transformable. Um, and you know, in contrast to just representing dynamical systems as code or what have you, um, by representing them in this way, this, this way that may look uh, Byzantine at first, uh, we, can, we can provably safely transform them and map them in certain ways. For example, conducting mappings of state space um, that are a little bit similar to to homomorphisms in the fact, in the sense that they, they retain structure, they, they coarse grain a system, but in a consistent way. Um, they may be safe in a, in a consistent way um, that we can transform and thereby secure economies of performance, uh, of computational load, uh, memory, or what have you. Uh, turns out they're further composable we can sort of take dynamical systems and collapse them down. And um, we can view, uh, on the one hand, a system as composed of an orderly set of, of building blocks, all arranged with um, uh, hierarchically and, and through combinations with products, co-products, uh, tensor products to express parallel composition, coupled or uncoupled. Uh, and and arrange in these hierarchies or networks, and then we could collapse them down to have just one level and do that all in a, in a seamless way, in a way that's, um, uh, that is easily uh, reasoned about. Uh, they're supportive of analytic reasoning as well. Um, I'm actually not sure if we'll get to this by the last lecture uh, that we'll be able to cover together. Uh, if not, it'll be like one lecture of the Topos course beyond uh, that I'd recommend that you check out uh, David Jazz Meyer's second talk, uh, which I think is 
maybe talk six. Um, but, uh, but basically, by representing dynamic, dynamic systems like this, it turns out that we have this just astonishing properties that are retained. And, and it turns out that if you represent them like this, the behavioral modes of the underlying system, uh, their equilibria, for example, or other features of them, oscillatory behavior, combine in a way that can be analogized to matrix arithmetic, much as when we're looking at uh, profunctors used in the context of feasibility relationships, the cost of going from Saskatoon to Seattle or the cost of, or whether it was possible to get from Saskatoon to Hawaii via boat. Um, we used a kind of form of matrix uh, arithmetic, a kind of uh, uh, twisted form of it there. Um, a generalization of it would be a better way to put it. Uh, and, and it turns out that by representing them as polynomial functors, you, you, you could secure the same uh, benefit as, as David Jasmeyer shows. And it turns out that as David uh, in that same lecture shows, it's incredibly elegant. You actually have um, much as in modeling, we sometimes talk about molecules of, that are sort of modeling patterns we reuse, um, kind of exemplars of a certain way of characterizing something that have a pithy kind of pattern associated with them. It turns out behavioral modes have the same thing. And by using those in your modeling, you can actually derive the behavioral modes. It's kind of a strange thing, but behavioral modes have a, have a certain symbolic and visual representation that you can use to derive analytically, uh, sort of solve for them as it were, um, or identify the conditions under which they apply with polynomial functors. So, you know, when you first encounter this, it's Byzantine, the rules seem strangely arbitrary and, um, and sort of uh, Baroque. But when you, uh, when you actually start to tally up the benefits, they turn out to be very compelling. Um, not at all obvious when you're in the weeds. Um, it's not at all easily easy to see the forest, but this is where we're going, sort of things that have, have all these nice properties that you see here. And believe it or not, polynomial functors turn out to have those properties. Um, okay, um, so uh, we had talked about uh, many features of this last time, These, the fact that these are polynomials, not in scalars and not in you know, real numbers or integers, but in sets. Um, and it turns out dynamical systems can be represented as a particularly mapping, particular mapping between, type of mapping between polynomials. Um, and it's shown here. And I, I'm using actually this notation from David Jazz Myers, uh, which I find rather attractive. Um, so he writes this, what's called that, Len, what he calls a lens map uh, or a map between interfaces in this sort of way. We have one polynomial map to another one. And that's to distinguish it from what he calls a chart, which is associated with, for example, uh, coarse graining states or what have you. Um, and, uh, and here, if for the case of dynamical systems, we don't just have an arbitrary polynomial on the left. We have a a polynomial in a, in a very particular form, sort of S Y to the S, where S are states. Now P can be an arbitrary polynomial. If P is a monomial, if it's something like A times Y to the B, then, or O times Y to the I, where O is output, I is input, then actually it can be characterized with the wiring diagram. Um, but in general, it's a, polynomial uh, and and the reason we we have this kind of bi-directional component is because there's a lens there um, there's a lens with with functions uh, which for dynamical systems basically boil down to a readout function where you 
figure out the output coming from a certain state in an update function, where you basically take the current state, you take input, and you update to a new state. Think about a, think about a, a, a finite state automata. It takes an input in, if it's in a certain state, certain bubble takes an input in and it goes to another bubble or the same one. Um, and this reflects that in general, we have this kind of map forward on positions and backwards on directions. You may remember this. Um, there's this map in general, when we have a polynomial map, a map from one polynomial to another, for our case, this will be S, Y to the S. But in general, when you have this, you have one mapping that goes from positions to positions and another that goes from, from these exponents for the given position um, uh, back uh, to, this, uh, to this other uh, exponent here. Um, so the set associated this to the set associated with that. But in the context of um, of this uh, p, uh, p of one. So it's in the context of the mapping uh, from, from I here. So there's this bi-directional maps, one map on positions and one map on exponents that's contextualized by or, or is specific to this particular position once this came. Uh, and, and those, those two maps, one goes forward, one goes backwards. Uh, and, and hence we kind of write this like this, or David writes it like that, and I've adopted his convention. Um, so uh, when P is more than one term, this will correspond to a dynamical system, which has different modes where these modes are say governed by different rules. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I was hoping if had I more time to have a slide on this, but when we're modeling, there's many cases where our models need to take into account dynamical systems, which have different modes. Even if they're closed dynamical systems, so simulation without external input of, of, of any sort, we might have modes for different circumstances. Uh, you know, a mode when the system is, is not in, an out, uh, when we have a public health system, not in an outbreak or epidemic or pandemic mode, and one then when it transitions into that mode and all sorts of wild and woolly things happen as we know, like professors getting seconded. Um, uh, or there may be a case where someone, you know, does not have, um, a, uh, a chronic condition and does, uh, or uh, a case where there's a, um, a person who's living freely in the community versus being institutionalized uh, due to some, um, uh, some challenge, you know, maybe it's old age or maybe it's a chronic condition. So we have these different modes that something can be in. Uh, and depending on the circumstance of infection, the occurrence of infection will be another mode for a person um, where different you know, behaviors are, are exhibited, different behaviors are at issue, different inputs are required. Uh, and so we can characterize those different modes with uh, different positions associated with a polynomial, different terms uh, on this right-hand side. And it turns out there'll be a mapping like this representing initialization of that system. It's a mapping from Y. So essentially it picks a mapping on inputs, picks an S here. Uh, it picks uh, uh, a value of S uh, to which to, to map. So dynamical systems make use of lenses. This is the lens paradigm we saw in optics. Uh, and and use that to manage outputs and manage update to the system, where the exponents on the right-hand side consist of input to the system. Um, so we're dealing here with exponents as inputs, elements of the 
of the sum as kind of outputs. And, uh, and the polynomial uh, has this kind of mode dependent uh, interface um, uh, or this, uh, these different governing regimes that are the different terms here on the right-hand side. Okay, um, great. Um, and in this context, these would be different inputs uh, here, essentially. Um, right, uh, okay. Uh, so we talked about mappings between poly polynomials uh, last time. We saw these mappings occur in two directions. Uh, and very importantly, and I didn't emphasize this last time, this mapping back um, uh, to uh, from say this point to this point, it's very important to recognize that this mapping back, um, uh, this mapping uh, phi sub i is actually specific to a particular source here of, of this, uh, this mapping phi sub one. So in other words, there might be multiple elements of P1 here. The, the polynomial on the left is mapped to the polynomial on the right through a mapping of P1 to Q1, uh, but there might be many elements here on the left to P1 that map to the same Q1, but each of them will have, each of those will have a different map from this guy back. So they may say this first element and the second element may both map here, but there'll be a different mapping, say from this guy for this uh, second element than there will be from the first element, right? It will go back here to um, say maybe to, to this one for P, P1 of the first element and P1 but it, this may map to this guy here for the second element. Um, so even though both one, uh, both one maps to this and two maps to this, this mapping from one back um, uh, is going to occur differently. Uh, here it's mapping back to two, because two map to it. So with P, this P1, it mapped over to Q1. Here's P of one is e one, two, three. Q of one is one, two, three, four. So this mapping here mapped this guy to the first guy. So one to one. And therefore this has to map back to one here. Um, and we see that. Uh, it also mapped uh, two onto one here. But now this one, uh, we'll have a separate mapping back to two here. So this mapping that we see from here goes to whatever sort of fiber here, whatever um, source for this, uh, uh, for, the, for the P1 um, to these exponents here. Uh, rather, uh, rather than just to a fixed thing. It's not like there's just one mapping from this. There may be multiple, depending on whether there's multiple of these elements of the set that map over here. Uh, okay. Um, right. Uh, and that's why, for example, as David Spivak said, if I have a deck of 52 cards, how it determines whether I consider myself as having heads or tails will be a different mapping than whether I consider myself as having rolled a six versus a five versus a four, three, two, or one. Um, if I use this to kind of determine my would-be dice roll, um, then it's a different mapping back for that than it would be for the uh, flipping of a coin. Okay. Um, so we didn't talk about this last time, but it turns out these mappings between polynomials compose. So if we have a mapping P to Q and a mapping Q to R, um, let's say F and G, uh, they compose. So we have a mapping from this, it's a familiar triangle from Q to R, uh, which is just the composition of these. And, and that's nice. Um, 
and familiar. It's F followed by G, okay, um, as you'd expect. But because the mappings back from the exponents are kind of backwards, we have a kind of flip situation when we compose these mappings or these mappings. Um, we have a mapping from, uh, from QI back to F of I and a mapping from G I, uh, from, excuse me, uh, yes, and a mapping, excuse me, from Q exponents back to P exponents or from R exponents back to Q exponents. And, uh, and those mappings uh, take place in this other order. So we have this mapping going first and then this mapping in order to get back to P of I. Um, it kind of goes backwards. They, they travel back to this. And if there were something else from which this map back, it would then map back further. Um, but notice there is this H of one in there because this mapping is occurring from the point mapped to by, by um, I here. And so it's, it's occurring back to the thing that, that mapped to it in P of one to Q of one. And same thing, this one has to map back to this one. Uh, and so there's actually an H of one, which is this composition here of F and G, which has occurred. Uh, involved in the mapping from R back to P. So these ones compose forward, these ones compose backwards uh, in this kind of way. And hence again, this notation of a forward arrow and backwards arrow. Uh, so here we have F followed by G, here we have G followed by F because we're mapping back and then we're mapping back, but they're using indices computed in this forward mapping. Um, it's a little bit, little bit twisted uh, because they're mapping back to the thing that mapped to them this way. Okay, um, that may seem a bit twisty. Chayan I know is, has also struggled with, uh, like me with David Jazz Meyer's uh, work where he's dealing more directly with these using, using terms uh, talking about bundles with their fibers uh, and sections, and it's um, uh, perhaps less familiar terminology than this will be. This, this sort of backwards map is a bit hard to get your mind around, but uh, it can grow on you after a while. Um, okay, so the idea is whatever we map to here has to be mapped back to that associated exponent. Um, this has, so whatever we map, uh, we're mapping from this to this, the exponent of the thing to which we're mapping has to map back to the exponents associated with the source fundamentally. And that's why that's that backward mapping. Okay. Um, right, so when we have monomials, we really have a, a lens uh, type of situation here. I'm not going to uh, dwell on this, but fun, uh, fundamentally we have something very analogous to a lens where we can move from uh, A to A prime, uh, or we can uh, go and have um, A, A cross B prime uh, mapping it to B. Um, so we can kind of think of this a bit like a, uh, a lens. Now, something David, talked about, which I think is really useful and will provide the basis for us to talk about building up these systems out of these ways of combining polynomials, is think about this simple Moore machine. Um, so uh, in finite state automata, we have Mealy and Moore machines. Uh, this is a Moore machine, and it's taking in inputs, and it's putting out outputs. Um, that are dependent on the state. So there's some internal state S here, which is latent, it's not shown, um, but that state's evolving with each A and it's reading out for each state Bs. So the net effect is to transform in generally in a way that is memory full, not memory less 
um, A's and streams of A's into streams of B's because we have this dynamical system here. Um, and the basic uh, idea of it is, is of this form. So we have S Y to the S uh, with this lens map to O Y to the I. And I put the O to indicate output and I to indicate input. And it's mapping input streams to output streams. Um, so this may seem unfamiliar, but the readout here is mapping, well, in general, if you map between P and Q, uh, you have P1 to Q1. Um, here, P1, the set of all positions is S. The set of all positions on, for the left side, set of all positions for the right side is O. Um, and this is the familiar map of readout for dynamical systems. It reports the specific output to be reported for a given S. Now, this is really a map. Each position here, so, so there's a separate position for each value of S. You could think of this as you know, Y to the S for the first value of S, plus Y to the S for the second value, possible value of S, plus Y to the S for the third possible value of S for each of those values. So if S has three possible values on the left-hand side, this would be Y to the S plus Y to the S plus Y to the S. One of those for each of those values of S, right? Um, so P of one is one for each of those. That represents a set of all possible values of S. And, um, and similarly for, for O here, um, those are each different positions. And there's really a mapping from values of S, possible values of S, to those values of O. That's a mapping between positions, therefore. Mapping position to position, position on the left to position on the right. Okay. Um, and then, so that's phi of, phi of one here. Um, that's the mapping forward like this. Now we have to deal with this mapping backwards, uh, phi sub i. Now phi sub i is mapping back for a particular source i um, where from the column mapped to by that, by that, from that I, from, from this, it's mapping back from this to P of I specifically. And it's mapping back to it for this particular, um, uh, this particular I. Uh, so each I is a separate mapping phi I that's mapping back to it, mapping back from wherever it maps to the exponents for that back to it. Um, now, here, Q of I is, is simply I. Um, and P of I is, well, it's the thing it maps to. It's the set S in the exponent one. Set S in the exponent right there. So, um, excuse me, it's a uh, uh, mumble. Uh, yes, it's the set S in the exponent. That's why P bracket I. Um, and, and so here, uh, we have a mapping from I to S that is specific to S. It's specific to the value of I. It's specific to the particular element of S with which we are dealing. So you could think of it as kind of a map from S cross I to S because it's specific to whatever S you had, this mismapping from I to S because this mapping here is specific to whatever mapped into it. It's specific uh, for this one that mapped into it, we map back to it. For If this one had also mapped into it, there'd be a separate mapping to this one here. So it's kind of like having a mapping from S cross I to S, specific to S, or specifying for a given S, some mass mapping from I to S. Um, and what this leads to, is exactly this idea of the lens. Uh, this is the readout and this is the update right here. Um, uh, and uh, here um, for initialization, we're mapping 
uh, essentially um, you know, we're picking an S or you can map uh, here uh, from uh, in, this, uh, in this sort of way, which is a, as a map to, uh, to this, um, I actually, actually, I think this should be S, Y to the S on the right here, not, not this thing here. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, okay, so specified dynamical systems. Um, so dynamic, the power here, as I said early on, is that dynamical systems can be specified using combinations of polynomials. Um, so uh, this is the idea of building up a specification of a dynamical system from building blocks, where these building blocks are readily combinable in a sort of Lego-like way. Um, uh, so we, we use the mechanisms that we've seen already to combine polynomials. And there's basically four mechanisms, only three of which we've really seen uh, before, uh, but the fourth of which, in fact, the last two of which will become very prominent in the next lecture. So co-product um, has to do with specifying polynomials by adding them together. Product, specify them by multiplying them. Tensor product, specify by tensoring them, which is allows them to operate in parallel, but it can be done either in, in a coupled way or a decoupled way. And again, that will be front and center for, for the wiring diagrams. And then there's composition, which consists of nesting of these systems. Um, and tensor product and composition play this really big role uh, we'll be seeing in wiring diagrams. So I'm gonna concentrate on the first of those here, uh, first two. Uh, but I'll, if time allows, I'll talk about this third one. So co-product, you may remember the idea, oh, 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 where, where's my co-product? Oh no, here's co-product. Um, okay, uh, no, this is actually, I want product. Um, so this, uh, this should be product that's, that's in red. I'm going to discuss product. Okay, so you may recall the products of polynomials well, you, you know how to take a product of polynomials probably since middle school. Uh, you multiply them in this way and you kind of, there's this nice distribution property and you sum up all the things of the same exponent and basically the exponents add, right? So you have two y squared times y to the q, y cubed and you get two y to the fifth. So it's two times y to the two plus three. All right. Um, if you have two y squared times y, um, that's y to the one, you get two y to the two plus one or two y cubed, three. Okay. Um, uh, so um, interpret it in terms of directions or choices, you can interpret it kind of like this. You may remember this from Nelson Neo's uh, first lecture or second lecture on this, I think the second day where he talked about, you know, if you had two y squared, you'd represent it on a, on a position wide basis is y squared plus y squared. Just take that apart into its positions. And then you have here y cubed plus y plus one. And then if you multiply them, you kind of get the multiplication of them like this. And what, what Nelson did, which I think is rather helpful, is draw these things in different colors so you can see whence they came for the combination. So um, these combinations here um, are reflective of exactly the different terms in the product here. Um, and uh, it's a different polynomial than is up here, but it's the polynomial that comes out of here. So Here's two y to the fifth, for example. Here's the y to the fifth components. Um, or two y cubed that comes out of it is, these are the cubes. Or, or two y squared, here's the two y squared, right? Um, but the green came from this side, the black from this side. And the idea is like, from a choice perspective, 
or the perspective of inputs of a dynamical system, it can either take this input or it can take this input. It's not taking all combinations of them. At any one time, it's, it's having one of them that it's taking. But its outputs, it turns out, will be the product of the outputs. And so we're going to see this. We're going to use one of these here um, to combine systems. And what are the systems we're going to combine with the product? Well, they're two simple systems. And we'll combine them to, to be a system that's got a little bit more texture to it. Um, so uh, the first system is this retain and output the same state. This, this actually is from, oh my, uh, it's from day, uh, I actually thought it was from day four, but um, that he covered this. But um, uh, here um, uh, we have the system that basically just uh, takes, uh, takes its current state, reads it out and, and basically continues on in that same state. So to call this a dynamical system is maybe stretching it. It's only a degenerate, a most degenerate um, uh, dynamical system. So the readout here uh, is just reporting the particular value of the state. And the update here is particularly sclerotic. It's, it's particularly rigid and, and kind of impoverished. Um, uh, because we have a mapping uh, which is going back from y to the one. So it's going back from one cross n into n because it's a separate mapping, remember, from one to n that's specific to whatever this was, n. So it's like a mapping from n cross one to n. Each of these n's has a separate mapping from one to n. And what will it do? Well, it will just retain the same state. So this is kind of a boring uh, dynamical system. It just pours its heart out every time. It just, just tells the current state and it continues on the current state. Okay, so not that, not that interesting, but the next one will, will be kind of its nemesis. It's kind of alter ego, it's, it's uh, opposite. Um, and it's Jekyll to its hide. And here, we're gonna have a dynamical system that just, so this one never changed its mind. It never changed what state it was in. This one always <laughs> changes what state it's in. It always gets input and it just adopts that input. This one didn't take any input. I mean, well, it took it kind of, so next, next, next. It just took like, like no, no varying input. It just took one that said like, go, 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 keep on going. Um, this one just takes any input and adopts it, okay? So here, uh, the, you'll notice that the, the form of the left-hand side is the same here, and they'll provide our trick or our ability to, to easily combine them with product. So we have S, Y to the S here. So the state in both cases is natural numbers N. Okay. Um, uh, but we're going to have input N here, so natural number. So we're inputting a natural number. Here we didn't have any input worth beans. But here we have a, a natural number that's input. Okay. And we're going to need uh, a readout here that goes from natural number to the only to this these positions, but there's only one such position. It's one. So all that's going to be is outputting a fixed value. There's only one function from natural numbers into the unit, the the to, to the single possible value. And that is where it outputs for any natural number that value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so uh, so this is going to just be outputting unit, so outputting the only possible value it had right, for one. Update here is going to be something that 
takes this natural number, it's gonna be a mapping from n to and from natural numbers to natural numbers, but contextualized by this. In other words, it's it's um, gonna be specific to this one. Uh, and here uh, we're gonna we're gonna know our current state, but we're just gonna blow it away. We're gonna ignore it. And we're just gonna take whatever input we got and just use our input. Um, so, so we have recourse to our current state, but whatever input we get, we're gonna override it and just use that as our new state. So this one never changed its mind. This first one retain an output. This one always changes its mind based on the input. Um, and each of them is boring. Each of them is impoverished. Each of them is kind of extreme in, in, a, in a somewhat uninteresting way. Um, but we can combine them with products to get something that's actually a little bit um, more interesting. Um, so we could kind of repeat our last input until the next valid input, um, kind of retain the last valid input until a new one overrides it. It was by multiplying them. So what do we do? We have two of them which have this sort of form. Yes, indeed, this is from day four, as I thought. So we have, both of them have this form on the left. I'll call that S Y to the S. Um, and one maps it on the left uh, to this thing. The other maps it on the left to that thing. Uh, and so one thing we can do is, is to, create a map to the product uh, of these um, uh, on the left. And, and that may strange, seem strange, but here's the reasoning. Um, uh, so we have a pair of maps here, one from NY to the N to NY, that's this one, that was our first one, retain an output this one that never changes its mind. It just outputs always its state um, bullheadedly. And that's one of the things we have. This is the other thing we have. And natural, uh, so n y to the n to, to y to the n. This one always gets overwritten. Okay, so we have a pair of these. And that's the same as, it's isomorphic to a pair of, to a, to a map from the same source to a pair n y to the n, uh, excuse me, n y comma y to the n. So this can be transformed equivalently isomorphically into this, um, which you'll recognize is of the form of one of these dynamical systems where, where this is on the right-hand side. Um, and we could expand this as just the, the product here. And, and this turns into, because this is, these are sets and this is Cartesian product, this just turns into n y to the n plus one. Um, so it's as if we have input that's either invalid or it's a natural number mm, on the right-hand side. And we, uh, could either choose to update the state uh, with a new valid input, or we can just retain the the current the, the current state. So, how do we do that? Well, we need a mapping like this, and its first element, or sort of its mapping on industries, is going to be n to n, this guy to this guy, um, that just um, retains the current state. Uh, by contrast, um, this mapping on indices back will have to go from n, n plus one, this thing in the exponent, back to n, contextualized by n. In other words, in the context of and specific to a particular n that's known. Well, okay, for that n, we get an input m. I chose it for maybe. If, if maybe is nothing, in other words, it's this distinguished value, 
then we just use n. We just repeat n, um, our existing last known good one. Otherwise, we use m um, if m was, in fact, the natural number. I didn't expand it with just or what have you. Uh, so um, the net, net upshot of this is that the product has the product of the outputs. One of these had sort of a trivial output, no meaningful output at all. One had, um, so it's output one, one had output natural numbers and the product has the product of the outputs, which is just natural number because the natural number paired with some fixed thing. Um, no extra information. Um, but as a choice of the inputs, it can kind of choose, okay, do I have this one or, or this one? Which of them is going to apply and how to handle them? I get this or this provided to be either an invalid value or a valid value. Okay. Um, so that's pretty nifty. That was actually product. Um, Co-product, ah, I got to I got to change this. Sorry, um, this is just perverse. Uh, Co-product uh, here is going to play a role that actually turns out to be a little bit more subtle and rich. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought it's pretty nifty. You can kind of build these things up out of building blocks. It's that's. Kind of nice. Um, but coproduct allows us to handle different modes of these dynamical systems. And just as a reminder, coproduct is very modest. And, you know, if we have two polynomials, P and Q, we add them together, we just get the number of these are polynomials in set. And so this is like taking the disjoint union of these two sets. It's just adding together these sets, these associated with these polynomials. It's just like an either of these. Um, and you know we could combine it and kind of consolidate them if we wanted to. Um, but uh, with dynamical systems, we'll often use this coproduct structure in a really cool way to capture different modes of this system. So the the example which came out in lecture three, which I thought was 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 cool, even if it was a bit confusing uh, when you first encounter it was these Turing machines. And the idea here is, is, is a fairly um, simple, although rich one. So we have a Turing machine as a tape and it has a finite state machine with a head that is at a certain point on the tape. And we're gonna have sets that denote movements, L and R, move the head left or move it right and alphabet that we can write on the tape, zero, one, and blank. Um, uh, and uh, the idea is in a given step, the current position of the tape relative to the head can either be moved left or right, um, or it can be written with a, with a, I call it a digit, but it's one of these guys. Um, I never liked when I was young, the fact that it's blank. And I, now that I'm old, I still don't like the fact that it's blank. Um, uh, I would think, but I guess it's to indicate the end of the tape, for example. Um, okay, um, which makes sense. Um, okay, uh, so the tape, here's, here's part of the trick. Um, the tape uh, is, is considered infinite in both directions. And, and it's really important to understand this example that you understand that the tape is a mapping from integers, therefore, could be negative, could be positive, to alphabetic characters. So it's a mapping Z to A, uh, where Z is, is integers. So for a given integer, we get you know, some character that's written on the tape. Um, and uh, the idea behind this dynamical system is there's a processor and a tape. And both of them have this form of a dynamical system. Here, they're secretly uncoupled. Next time, we'll 
see how you can couple them. But um, uh, next time with wiring diagrams and these coupling between these parallel systems is going to be a major theme, um, coupling between parallel systems in general. But here we have this dynamical system in this one. This is a lens map from SY to the S. So the state is S into this. Um, and uh, what's on the right here uh, basically involves, this is without considering halting. If, if we have time, we'll get to the halting here. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, um, the idea is that for the current processor, based on its current state, it will either move left or right, or it will output something um, to the tape, zero, one, or blank, right? And, um, and you could think of that to a degree as kind of different modes, one for head movement, one for processing characters, but really where we'll get into modes is in the next slide in spades. Uh, you could kind of think of it this way. Um, but they're really not governed in different ways because in each case, after whatever you do, you're reading and updating to the new state. So A is a value read from the tape, okay? And, uh, and then the tape uh, has a map here. Okay. Um, and the tape map goes from the state of the tape, which is T Y to the T. Mind you, T is this whole blooming state of the tape. I mean, it's this whole map from integers to A. And uh, it, there's a map for it to, to this thing A. Uh, so that's the value red. Um, plus MTA, this is what it's gonna to be told by the processor, move left, move right, relative to the head, or, or um, write a character, mm, write a new character. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this. Um, so uh, here for the tape, uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to have two components, this lens map. Uh, so this is a map between polynomials, it's a lens map. Um, so one is going to take T to A, it's the map on positions. Remember, we have two maps, one on positions, and then one for each position, source position, a map back from where it mapped to, to that, to the exponent in that position, uh, map back from the exponent where, to which it mapped to the to, to the position to the exponents for the position. Okay, the source position. Okay, so V of one is mapped from T to A. Um, and it's gonna say, okay, for the current, for for the current tape, how do I get my my output A? Well, um, the idea is I just return whatever's at the current point in the tape, kind of the current position zero of the tape, the current focal point of the tape. So here we have the tape uh, as itself being a mapping from Z to A. Uh, and so we just get value at zero and that's an alphabetic character. Okay, um, zero, one or B. Um, so, so here, the mapping just reads the value of the tape at the current place, okay, um, where the head is, T of zero, okay. Okay, now phi of I is, is much more subtle or more, more, uh, more involved. Uh, okay, so phi of I is specific to a particular T. We have a different map back, um, for each value of t um, and different map to the exponent for that value of t. Okay. Um, so for each of the t positions here, for each tape, in other words, we have tape t. We have a map from m plus a from this exponent back to t. Okay. 
And we can think of this as two maps. Um, there's a movement map, M to T, that's kind of going M to T. And then there's a right digit map from A to T. Oh, oh each of them produces a T, huh? Um, okay. Uh, so they're, but these are all specific to whatever the tape is right now. They're gonna produce a tape, but it's gotta take into account what the tape is right now. That, that source position, um, because this mapping is specific to the source position. To just make that very, very clear, in case you missed it, this mapping back from this guy is specific to the source position as a different mapping back to two. Uh, so both two and one, whoa, uh, both two and one map to one, but there's a different mapping back for two than there is for one. Um, so it's it's specific to that. And this in this case, it's specific to the to the tape. Okay, it's specific to the tape. So it, it says value t of the current tape. Okay, it's specific to the to the current tape. This give me a mapping back like that. Yeah. So what's it going to do? Well, okay, if we have a movement, we need a mapping from M to T. Uh, um, uh, and here, um, what we're going to do is we're going to move the tape. We're going to define a tape that's the same as the old tape, but it shifted by one. Mm, so if we move left, um, we're going to return a tape. That's what this is. This is a this is a tape. The tape is just a mapping from Z to A. So this is our mapping from Z to A. What mapping is it? Well, it's the same as the mapping used for the tape T, but it's shifted by one. So it's just off off by one from the the current tape. Um, so what we consider kind of the contents of the tape will be the same as the original one, but it will just be shifted one to the left or one to the right, depending on whether we've gone one to, to the left or to the right. So, so this is the tape. Um, when we get a value of L, we map back to a tape that is the same constants, just shifted by one. And this is defining what the tape is, because the tape is a mapping from integers to characters. This is an integer this is a character and it's defined in terms of t which is the value of the tape with which we started here um, that we, that that it's um uh, that for which this mapping is being defined okay writing a digit so this doesn't modify the tape it just shifts it it just it doesn't change the contents of the tape it just uh, shifts its relative position writing a digit is another matter writing a digit maps from A uh, is essentially a mapping from uh, A to A to the Z or A to, um, sorry, uh, yes, uh, which is a mapping from A to Z to A. So it's a mapping from this to something that looks up for a given location on the tape, looks up uh, a character. Okay, and what is this gonna be? Well, the new tape, this is defining the new tape um, in light of A will be the old tape, um, except where I equals zero at the current place, the current place where the head is, it'll use A, it'll, it'll use the thing that's being written to it. There we go, so that's the new tape. This was the old tape. We, for all cases, we just use the value there, except at the place where we're writing, where we use the new value. Um, okay. Um, and I'm over time now. Um, if anyone wants to stick on for office hours, I will uh, finish up the halting Turing machine. So the halting Turing machine is actually the same as what we've been dealing with, except it has a little bit more, um, um, more texture to it. Specifically, it uses this property of coproducts, like we were saying. So we have different modes of the processor, 
and indeed different modes of the tape. Whereas before, all we had on the right was this for the processor. Now we have that or a halt specific mode where we're halted. And for the tape, where we used to have just this type of thing on the left without this halt, now we have this halt that needs to be considered by the tape. And we have this other mode it can be in where it just preserves the tape in an invariant state for perpetuity. Um, and on the left-hand side, we now have this intriguing thing. Instead of being T Y to the T, um, we have this go T and halt T. We have two different T's. And it's still of the form S Y to the S because, or V Y to the V, because this is also reflected here. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, it's a pretty clever idea. Um, so the idea is, look, um, instead of just the processor just choosing to move or write zero, one, or blank, um, uh, using the, the tape, it can now halt. And it can get into this halt state where it's just kind of frozen. And the halt state takes no meaningful input, no varied input. Um, uh, it just um, uh, it just maps from whatever is up here. Uh, so basically, it takes some clock or some indicator of time, some sort of non-varying input, uh, and it sort of just takes some sort of uh, vacuous input, and it maps over uh, to to the same same state, presumably, and just continues. Uh, it can go into this halt state at a time of its choosing, depending on whether it's what it's read. In general, the processor instructions will depend on the program, and therefore we're not specifying all of them. Um, the tape, by contrast, um, has a more or less fixed um, um, sort of mode of operation. Um, so once again, we have phi one and phi i, phi one and phi i, just like before. Um, but now we have to map on positions uh, here over to this. And it's kind of a, a nice mapping. So for go state, we always map to, um, to a. Um, so we're always kind of going and and just reading an A. Um, and, and so it's the same as before. No, there's been no difference. For halt here, uh, we are just preserving the tape. So we're just mapping it directly to this T. So no change there. Uh, oh, well, sorry, it, there's no change to the tape. We're just staying in the same tape state. Oh, halt. With T, we're just remaining there. Okay, so this is a, a different mode. Um, and then for phi i, okay, well, okay, we have, we have a different, so we got to figure out these these darn maps. Unfortunately, it's it's pretty pretty similar to before. It's really very similar. Um, th the case that we have to deal with now is halt. Um, so we've got a map M plus A plus halt back to this guy, uh, depending on, on where we are here. Okay, so um, if we're in a halt state here, uh, by the way, we'll, we'll just, uh, uh, it will, uh, uh, right. I, I th think actually this mapping can only be reached when they're in the go state. And we're going to use that information about the current value of t, just like we did before, uh, for movement and for writing the digit. So those two were, are just the same as before. Um, what's different 
here for Halt, for this Halt thing, is that for Halt, we're going to go uh, and we're going to map onto this state here, this, this Halt state, okay? Um, so uh, for these other ones here, we're, we're mapping into this go state um, and, and we're doing so uh, according to movement and writing digit, just like before. Here we go. Um, uh, and uh, for this halt state, we're going to be mapping to the halt here. So we'll be mapping over over to the halt state. And uh, when we map to that halt state, we're going to be from then on essentially just just preserving this current this current tape. So halt is going to map here into halt of t, and it's just going to preserve the current value of the tape. And from then on, we will be in this halt state, which remains in the halt state from now on and goes over to uh, to T. So in short, uh, our what we've done by adding halt is we've provided additional modes, a mode for the processor by which it's halted, in which it's just sits halted, and a mode for the tape uh, where it just preserves the tape from then on. Okay. Um, right. Um, so, Turing machine salt. Um, I was going to present tensor product, but I think uh, I'll do that next next time. Uh, we'll do that next time as part of the um, uh, the, the lecture four um, coverage. I should say next time Wednesday we're going to use for questions Q and A's, but. Um, uh, in, in our next uh, discussion together uh, with slides, uh, we'll, we'll be seeing the, uh, the tensor product. And the tensor product can be used, for example, to have two systems, two discrete time dynamic systems, one outputting O and taking input I, the other outputting B and taking the input lowercase i. The first use is uppercase, the second use is lowercase. And we can combine them into a system that takes capital I and lowercase i as input, the product of the two, the Cartesian product of the two, and outputs both O and B. Um, and that represents systems in parallel. Uh, so, so we've seen here that these systems provide these combinations. We can build them up with products, with co-products, with tensor products, and we'll see hierarchical nesting with wiring diagrams and tensor products being used for coupled systems. We've been dealing here with kind of uncoupled systems. Uh, even for our Turing machine, it's been straining it because the halt state here is not directly forcing the tape into a halt state, et cetera. But, but these examples hopefully show something about how you can build up these systems out of pieces in a way that is rather pleasant. Um, and, uh, and we'll see uh, ways in which they can be added. Uh, we can add transparency, visual representation, composability, and analytic reasoning, and a sort of an elegant representation in support of that that uh, analytic reasoning in next time in subsequent lectures. Um, uh, we're pl I'm planning to cover six of these lectures if possible, but we may only get to uh, five of them. Um, our next discussion on Friday will be on lecture four, but on Wednesday we'll have um, q and A, &A uh, more generally about this material. Okay, so those are all my comments here for today. Um, 
And I will open it now to general discussion for office hours. So thanks.